All right, well, I'm sitting here with a, a Greg Edmondson, who is the composer of, you know, such things as Firefly, the series, uh, worked on King of the Hill and, and Uncharted, but uh, thank you so much for doing this, Greg. I am thrilled to be here. Um, so tell me how you got started in music and what drew you to composing for visual narratives. You know, it's kind of a long and convoluted journey, but I find that for so many people it is. I moved to Los Angeles and I was working as a as a guitar player. And early on, I got the opportunity to work for Hanna Barbera to to write for them. Oh wow! And uh, you know, I mean, it was just a kind of a fluke, but you know, I immediately loved it. I didn't work there very long, and I kind of moved over and started working for a guy named Mike Post, who's like a really big guy in the yeah, television. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, that was a great learning experience because you learned so much and you saw how it's all done. And that was, you know, back at a time when most of the dates were still, you know, live dates. You would go to one of the studio stages and record most of it with, you know, not large orchestras, but, you know, 30 guys or so. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I just so loved working to picture that I never looked back. And I really also enjoyed, in a certain way, being in charge, uh, it, 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 let me liken it to this. It's a little bit like an actor and a, and a director. The actor has all the fun with pretty much not, not as much of the pressure. They just have to do their job well. Mm-hmm. The director has to oversee the whole thing, but he also has control over how it turns out where the actor does not. So it's just a matter of where one feels the most comfortable, but I really love the idea of working to picture and then being able to kind of see it through from conception to completion. All right. Um- that makes sense. Uh, you know, I mean, starting going back, you composed, uh, you know, the score to Fi- for Firefly, which has gained a, a cult following, you know, since being you know, prematurely canceled. Um, a lot of composers and writers and, you know, TV crews face that fate every season, which, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. But uh, what dis- what disappointed you the most about not being able to continue on that? And was it easy to brush off to move forward? No, it was not. I loved Firefly more than I can possibly tell you. Uh, it, the way I got the gig is really unusual, and, and you know I was thrilled to have it, and I was extremely lucky because you know all the guys in, in, in L.A. wanted to do that gig because Joss had such a wonderful reputation, mm-hmm. and you know and so everyone wanted to do it. it for some reason, God only knows how. It, you know, one day the phone rang. Uh, Joss wasn't taking calls from any agents. So you couldn't have your agent push you for the gig because they weren't taking those calls from anyone. Mm-hmm. So everybody sent in a CD, and you know, uh, you know, pretty much once you do that, you then write it off because your chances of hearing back are slim and none. So it's not like you sit and look at the phone and hope it's going to ring. You just move on. One day the phone rang, and they said, this is Joss Whedon's office. Would you like to come down and meet Joss and talk to him about this new show? And I said, Absolutely. So I did, and I went down, and we had fun. And I'm giving you a little bit of background because it, it, it'll all make sense mm-hmm. uh, of why it was such a loss. Uh, so I went down, and I met Joss, and we actually had lots of fun. You know, we ended up arguing about, you know, who's the best British guitarist, you know. Oh, no, that, oh, no this guy's way better than that guy. You know, and just had fun. You know, we bonded. It was like two guys who knew each other just going, oh, no, my team's way better than your team. You know, just having a good time. And, you know, and after that, he just said, listen, I promised one other guy I'd meet with him, but you got the gig. And there I had it. So they they gave me the two-hour pilot, and I went home and I looked at it, and I said, this is the best designed television show I've ever seen. He has made something that he knows he with nine main characters, which is a huge amount for television. Right. And they were all completely different. They had weird, diverse backgrounds. You know, their personalities were completely, you know, flying in every different direction. Some of them had mysteries, you know, that you could uncover for years. I mean, let's, what, what is Rivers' real past? I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, there was so much to know. And I said, this guy's made something that can go for 10 years without repeating itself. It's not like a one-trick pony with uh, two guys in a fast car, where every episode is going to be two guys in a fast car which, mm-hmm. of course, is what they replaced Firefly with. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Fast Lane. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Two guys on a fast car. <laughs> and, but he had made something that was so interesting and so compelling. And one of the things I found terribly compelling among the, the myriad was that 
Joss make, makes really strong women characters, and we had five women characters, every one of them different than the other. Their strengths were not in the same places. They were all different, but they were all strong, and, and, and they all had weaknesses, as did everyone. And so I just said, oh, this is great. And, and then he started creating these moral conundrums, which is what he knew the show should be. Mm-hmm. But what, really what Fox wanted was, you know, two guys in a fast car, just in spaceships. Yeah. They just wanted a bunch of nonsensical action that really didn't make any sense. And Joss was not opposed to action, but he, just, he wanted the story to be interesting and compelling and have moral conundrums, you know, like wh- what do I, what's the right thing to do here? What's the wrong thing to do? And, uh, and those things are interesting and adult. And, and I said, I know people are going to love this. Well, the Fox spent $10 million on the pilot, which is a lot, and said, we're not showing it. Mm. We're just not showing it. Don't like the Western thing. But, you know, Joss never really made it as a Western. It was, it was more a post-apocalyptic show right. where the, the, the world as we know it didn't exist anymore. And your circumstances depended very much on, on your, your resources. And it did hearken in some way back to the history of our country in the sense that, you know, at one point in time, you know, if, uh, if you were staking a claim in Missouri, your life was very, very different than if you were a, a Rockefeller living in New York mm-hmm. because there were, you had different resources. Well, what, the, what this meant show-wise was you could have anything and it made sense. You could have laser guns. Or you could have six shooters. It all worked. Yeah. It, it was just a stroke of genius. Mm-hmm. He made a world where everything could work, just depending on how you, how you structured it. So it never really was meant to be a Western. I mean, it wasn't like gun smoke or anything. It just had elements of that, because if you had little resources, that, then you use what you have. If all you have is horses, you use horses. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. If, if you have really fast cars, you have really, then, then you've got that, too. You've got a spaceship. Use that. You can use it all. It all made sense, depending on how it was structured. So I, I looked at it, and I said, you know, I am working for 10 years. How This is so great. Ten years. I, I just said ten years. At least ten years. Well, little did I know, you know, that it was going to be closer to ten episodes. <laughs> Fox hated it. They did everything they could do to kill it, and and they succeeded. Yeah. But it was just, you know, and when it when it actually was over, I loved it so. I, the, the schedule on the show was really kind of wasn't going to work. I only had four, like about four days to to do the score on any episode. Wow. And you know it was ju- it was just a mess, which meant that I was working sixteen hours a day minimum. But you know what? Every every day that I got up at you know three in the morning to come down here and work, I turned on my TV and I looked at, at that that cast, and I said, I am thrilled to be here this morning. Mm-hmm. I am thrilled to be working with acting and writing this good. Firefly had weaknesses. And to me, some of the bad guys, some of them were the weak part. They were a little comic-y. Some of them were great, and uh, some of them could have gone on and, and, you know, been around for years, and they would have been great. But as you know, in television, you, you start shooting uh, in, you know, in July or so. And so by the time a show goes on the air, you've already shot six, maybe seven episodes, and you can't go back and make wholesale changes. Once you see what's really working and what people are responding to, you can make some changes. But you can't go back and reshoot the show. You don't have the time or the budget. Right. So you just hope to keep on going. And at the end of year one, hopefully at that point, you, the, the writing staff and everybody knows exactly what's working. And they've made all the changes. And year two should start like gangbusters. Mm-hmm. Well, Firefly never got that, that chance. They, when Fox told told uh, Joss we're not showing the pilot, of course Joss had to write another episode, to but but and it was a one hour episode, not a two hour. And in one hour you couldn't introduce nine main characters and give you any of the sense of why they were there, who they were, what they were doing, how why are, why were all these people together? How did they get together? You, you, that that had been done as good as it could be done in the two hour pilot. Yeah. So I feel for, for, for how broken his heart must have been, for, you know, for somebody. It's like, you know, you or I writing the best cue ever. And they go, we really don't like it. And, and it, that happens. But then you kind of go, you know, it's just that I don't know what to do next because I already took my, you know, I already did the, my, what my heart thinks is the best thing. But you still have to move on and do something else. And so he did. 
And, uh, you know, so the bottom line is I loved, loved, loved that show because I know what it could have been that it never got the chance to be. Right. And when it was finally canceled, you know, of course, I was the last guy in line because, you know, the writers were gone. They'd finished their job a long time before I got to score the last one. But I was so exhausted at that point. I went in, in Joss's office, and I literally cried pretty much like a little baby mm-hmm. because I was so sad because I knew there was not going to be a lateral move. I knew it wasn't like, oh, well, this one got canceled. Just go get another Firefly. Right. You weren't going to, you weren't, you weren't going to find one of those. So, yeah, it's it's tough. So that's a long story, but but it covers it it it, it 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 really covers my feelings for that show. I love it and I love it still, and I I love what he created. And Uncharted, in some ways, bears similarity to to that show. In, oh, definitely, in, in, yeah. In the, yeah, in, in, and here's the way I see it. Number one, you've got a couple of female characters in Uncharted. They're both strong in different ways. Mm-hmm. You have Nathan Drake, who's kind of a smartass. <laughs> Mal Evans was a smartass. You know, was it Mal Evans? I can't remember. I think, I think that was a Beatle roadie. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Beatle roadie. A- anyway, you know, Nathan Fillion, Mal, right. Mal Reynolds. Mal Reynolds, that's what it was. Uh, you know, our captain. I think it was. Yeah. Anyway, our, our lovely captain really had kind of the same thing. You know, he, he there were times when he was he was the strong guy. There were times when he 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 did things because he he couldn't he couldn't deal with his own vulnerability. I'll give you an example. Uh, in Firefly, one time, uh, uh, Anara, who he loved and who was a prostitute, was going out on a job. And he was introducing people around. He said, oh, by the way, and here's our whore. <laughs> but he didn't mean that. Really, I mean, really, and it was completely obvious. You meant what he, what he, what he couldn't say was, I love you. Please don't do this. <laughs> he couldn't say, I love you. It's almost like, you know, the old proverbial story of the guy who likes the, the girl in elementary school, doesn't know what to do, so he dips her pigtail in the ink. He yeah. just doesn't, doesn't know how to show his feelings. <laughs> so you love those things when people say one thing, but they mean another. It gives a depth and, a, and, and an interest to something than, than when his, everything is on the nose. And that requires really good writing and really good acting. And it had both of those. And Uncharted has both of those. And Nathan Drake in, is, has some of the same stuff. He's vulnerable sometimes. He can't always say what you say. He's a smart ass when he, you know, when he doesn't want to show that he's vulnerable. And, and they're not dissimilar. They, they really are not. No, not at all. I mean, yeah, they're, I mean, even the character design is almost the same. <laughs> they could, well, so in a, in a weird way, uh, my transition from Firefly was, to, was, you know, and little did I know it at the time, was to this world, where I, I've spent a while now. Right. And, you know, and, and how thrilling and how God has watched over me to give me something else that I can love. And, because I love Uncharted every bit as much as I love Firefly. Oh, and they're, they're two yeah. different deal, two different deals. But you know, I'm I'm as thrilled as I have been, and and I and I didn't lose a bit in in terms of creative uh, guidance because you know we all know who Joss is. Amy Hennig, uh, you know, is is every bit as much. Oh yeah, definitely. I don't know if you know who Amy is or not, but you know who Amy is, right? Uh, no, who who's Amy? I, Amy is the person at Naughty Dog who. In essence, it writes the script for Uncharted. Uh, okay. She's responsible oh, for the ca- yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> she's responsible for the casting, responsible for the acting, responsible for basically how it looks, the creative decisions that are what we know. Now, that's not to say she does it on her own. The team at Naughty Dog is unparalleled, uh, starting with you know Evan and Kristoff, the the two co-presidents. They all it, it, it's a team effort like 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 no other, mm-hmm. but. Amy is my go-to guy, so to speak, and uh, mm-hmm. she's the creative genius that drives it. In the same way, my my go-to guy on on uh, Firefly was Joss. If you if you needed a decision, he was the guy to go to because it was you know he he knew the right answer. Right. So, so anyway, I made a nice lateral move. It was just to another uh, uh, another area. And you know, just recently, you know, the world. Was a you know introduced to your th- score last week when La La Land released it, and the third game just came out this week. Um, and you know I've I've I played the first one, the second one, and and now I'm in the third one. And 
I think what surprised me the most about Uncharted is how many different different soundscapes and textures and and how you incorporate different cultural sounds and ethnic sounds and and, and uh, how much research did you have to do for all that because I I mean was it it didn't come you know straight from your head did it are we already familiar with all these di- because you're traveling you know globe trotting the world like how do you do th- like <laughs> how did you approach that yeah you, well you know that that kind of makes it all all fun you know i mean certainly you have to do some research and say you know what what can you know what can we use here mm-hmm. and they don't they don't always cross over you know in, in uncharted 2 we were essentially in tibet mm-hmm. so we got to use the giant tibetan horns and the beautiful arhu that gorgeous ancient Chinese violin that, mm-hmm. you know, Karen Han plays and, you you know, you tears run down your eyes because she's so good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that's an instrument that's so difficult to play. It's really not meant to sound beautiful like that. It's more meant to be primitive. But when she plays it, it's, it's just, it just sings like a, a, a voice. And it's so gorgeous. So, you, so obviously you can't use those. And, you know, when you look at the desert, the desert's kind of a different sound. So, we, you know, you go to the, you always find that ethnic people find something that is indigenous to the place they live. Mm-hmm. And the sound, the sound kind of matches that place. So we found, all, you know, of course, all these ethnic flutes. And we have the luxury of working with such a wonderful woodwind player, uh, Chris Bleth, who can play all of these. And play them beautifully. So you find what's 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 indigenous to that place, but then you back off a little bit and you realize that there are some ethnic instruments that you can put anywhere and they will still work, because it's not like everything has to be historically accurate as much as everything has to say we're in an exotic locale. And if it says that, you're 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 good to go. And that was something I kind of learned on Firefly, because I I you know I I started using all these ethnic instruments you know you know this is part of Joss's vision because all of the cultures had been thrown together so it made complete logical sense that the music could be all this stuff mixed together right but i realized that especially with stringed instruments you get a lot of bang for the buck if you actually see it because they all look different but a lot of times when you play them they just kind of sound like doink 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 <laughs> so, so the visuals really sell it a lot so you can you can mix and match it just depends on what makes it feel, you know. Uh, and I love the idea of using ethnic instrumentation as, for the most part, as seasoning, because you don't want it to sound like ethnic music. If you right, want it yeah, to yeah. sound like, if you want it to sound like ethnic music, just get a needle drop of a real ethnic band playing it. You just want it to be seasoning that says we're in an, we're in an exotic place, and we're not in Kansas, and we're doing something that you know has these exotic elements to it. So you just kind of learn as you go, and you just put one foot in front of the other and, you know, start and go. But it's really fun. I really love doing it. And you get lots of mileage out of those things. <laughs> you do. Um, so that, 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 was kind of, that was kind of the deal. That's, I mean, it's, it's, it definitely, when you, yeah, you're right, it kind of peppers throughout and, and places you in that world. Um, but o- over the past three games, I mean, Uncharted was your first video game, so then you, you've done second one and third one. How has your process changed at all, if it has? Have you, I mean, were you able to hit the ground running the, the these past two times versus the first one? Yes, yeah, I, I think that's fair and that's accurate. Uh, on the very first one, uh, basically, you know, when they when they called, uh, I, I wasn't sure that I could do the gig, so I told them, you know, maybe they should get somebody who knew that world better. And and they, you know, said, well, come on down and let's meet and talk. And we did. And you know, and of course, as soon as I met them, I loved them. The, the people at Naughty Dog are so great. And you know, so that was Amy and Bruce Swanson. And you know, they were just really encouraging. You know, and mm-hmm. and, and said, you know, go ahead and you know, play with it a little bit and take a shot at it. And I did. And so I did the first one. And a number of th- a number of things have changed in the in the first one. Uh, for one thing, the locale was different. In essence, it was uh, set in a jungle, which is kind of a closed-in environment. Right. But also, I was afraid of writing too much in terms of melody for gameplay, because they they said, you know, if we have to loop it, it's re- it can get really irritating if you know all of a sudden ba pi ba ba comes around every eight bars, and you know the player will get irritated and you know turn the music down or turn it off, and we don't want that. So the first one, I think, was a more ambient score, and and 
you know, did it work in the jungle? Well, I hope so. Oh, it definitely did. <laughs> but, 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 but it was just more, you know, more ambient, and a jungle is a great place to be ambient. Right. But then when we went to Tibet, all of a sudden, you know, now it was big and cinematic, and, and, and also I was ready to, to do something else. So I just told him, I said, let me just write some melodic content, and if you find I'm doing something that's not going to work, then, you know, tell me and let's change it. Let's fix it. But let me at least start off doing that. Mm-hmm. And when I work on these, I, I, I work with Amy, of course, but I also work with the Sony team, uh, the SCEA team. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jonathan Mayer is my go-to guy on that. And they're the ones who, in the long run, are going to implement the music into the game. So it's great to be able to work with them from the very beginning so that as I'm writing, they know what I'm writing. Right. So in other words, they're familiar with the music. Since they're going to have to implement it, if we run into something that's problematic, that isn't, that's going to make life really difficult, then you know, they would tell me that. You know? and, and there are things that composers do that make implementing music problematic. Uh, one of those is to never let it break, so that if you write a, a, a three-minute cue... It is one solid three-minute cue that gives them no way to cut into it or mm-hmm. to, to change to another piece of music. So, you know, we just work on those things and try to fine-tune them. And, and that way, when we get to the recording session and, and it's done, and now it's time to mix it and implement it into the game, everyone's familiar with the, the pieces that we're working with. And, and so it, it, nothing's coming as a complete surprise. What comes as a complete surprise is that sometimes music that you wrote for one section of the game, when all is said and done, may work as well or better in another section. Right. Reason, be, reason being that games, when you work on them, look nothing like the game when, 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 when you know, the player gets to actually buy it and play it. Mm-hmm. They're, just, they're, they're a mere shadow. I mean, sometimes you're looking at... at at, at figures that are all gray and have no eyes, and you know their hair's flaming red because it's, it, all of it, you know they just live piece by piece they put in layers of yeah. color, and so sometimes they may say, "Well, we're working on the hair now, but we haven't gotten to the rest of the stuff." So you, you just got somebody running around what looks like a, a, a stick box, and then when you finally see it, it's this beautiful exotic castle, but it, it's just not done. And that's why the music can be moved around sometimes from area to area, just depending on how it all works out. So, so, so the, the, the point of that is this. It really is a creative venture on everyone's part. It's not just the, the guy writing the music that needs to be creative. Uh, you know, it's Amy's game concept that, that, that has to be terribly creative. And, it, and, and I'll give you an example why. Uh, if you do a TV show... By the way, if you're not getting what you need, tell me, because I'll go on like this for hours. Oh, it's fine. No, no. This is working for you? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, good. Uh, we'll be sure and cut that out. Okay. Uh, uh, one of the things that's interesting about games and, and game scripts is this. If you, if you work on a TV show or a film, you get a script, and that essentially is going to be your Bible. That's going to guide you through the shooting process. Mm-hmm. So you storyboard it, and you give it to the actors, and everybody knows exactly what they're going to do. And you show up and you, you, you do the work and, and you're done. And you schedule it to, to match you know, the time frame that you have depending on what your budget is. Games are not so much that because they're ever-changing. If you're making a game over two years, you start, and then you start working on different areas and you start developing it. And you find that like all art, it changes as you go along. Sometimes an area that you thought was going to be super exciting may turn out to be less exciting than you thought. And you'd planned on having a, you know, be a 30-minute experience for the, for the gamer. But if it's less exciting, you're kind of going, well, maybe this should be a 10-minute a, a experience. Mm-hmm. Well, that means that the script has to change, and, and, and it has to change drastically because you're losing uh, essentially 20 minutes of your storyline. So, so the script has to be adaptable. And Amy has to change it and keep writing new stuff and new stuff and new stuff as it changes. So it's not like you just write it and shoot it. You write it and you sh- and you start work and then you change it. And you, even even though you've changed it all these gazillion times and gone back in with the actors, you still have to make a story point that from the experience of the gamer is linear and goes from A all the way to the end mm-hmm. and makes sense. It's really difficult. 
it's really, really hard uh, to be able to have an, a script be so adaptable. But number one, Amy can do it because she's a magnificent writer. And she also cast it really, really well. And, and let me go back to Firefly and why these are similar. Joss Whedon's genius in Firefly was the casting of the main cast. Those nine main characters were so good, I could never see anyone else in those roles. Oh, yeah, definitely. They, they owned those roles. Mm-hmm. And it, it, part of it was great writing, part of it was great casting. You know, and I never, when, those, when, when any of those nine people were on the screen, I was never bored. I never wanted to cut away from them. I just liked being with them. Well, Uncharted, Amy has cast it so well. And, 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 and given them words to say. And, and this, uh, in my opinion, it's the start, and, and other people are doing this now too, and some aren't. But if you're going to make a game that's, that's going to play like a movie, and I understand, of course, that all games are not. Some are meant to just be fun. Some are meant to be goofy. They all serve different purposes. Yeah. But, but if you're going to make one that plays like a movie, then not only, is it, not only do you have to cast the right people, but you have to give them words to say. A great actor with, without a script is, is like a great musician without any notes on the page. Mm-hmm. You, you, it, it all starts with a script. And, and and then you get the great actor, but she has a great team of actors, and they can come back time after time after time as that script changes, and they can they she can write the words and they can deliver them in such a way that there is a storyline, and an arc that goes from A to B, and and I think that really is so spectacular that she can do that, and I know how hard it is, and I know how how hard she works to make it happen so that that because you know. Scripts are a little bit like a house of cards. If you know, if you if you start moving stuff in the middle, it'll collapse. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's real easy to collapse. It's real easy to collapse it. You know, and you know, it's real easy to say, "Oh man, I had always been counting on this scene, but now I see that we're not going to. It's not going to work." Well, okay, you, now you still have to find a way to make the, the 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 thing work. Now, sometimes there are holes in scripts, and be, if you're if you're enjoying the experience. You forgive the whole. Right. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Iron Man. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. which I enjoyed. You know, I mean, Robert Downey Jr. is trying to learn how to work this suit, and he's down in his basement bouncing all over these expensive cars because he doesn't know how to work. He can't work the suit. Mm-hmm. Well, Jeff Bridges puts on the suit first time, ten times bigger. He immediately knows how to work it. Work it perfectly. <laughs> That's a script hole that you can drive a truck through. Yeah. But it didn't matter because you're having it, you know, you're enjoying the, the journey. All right. So you kind of go, well, I see the hole, but, you know, what do I care? I'm having a good time. So maybe some of that plays in. And, and, but, but long story short, that's a little bit why games are very different uh, to work on. And that also applies musically. And that's a little bit why music can be shifted around from A to B, because even though you're writing for a specific place at some point, you're using a lot of your imagination to write, since you really are not looking at finished product. Right. And it's going to change. And as it changes, you may, you know, sometimes music just accidentally works. Sometimes you kind of go, you know, I never thought this would have worked, but now that we're looking at it, it works. Happy, happy accidents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. And I mean, so it's probably almost similar to animation in a way where things are getting changed and changed and you're in different stages like that. Yeah, but animation's a little different because, you know, if you're doing animation, animation, they, they, they will sketch it out, but you at least see what the movement has is because you have to. Mm-hmm. In other words, if you're going to make music fit to picture and, you know, of course, cartoon animation, everything is, you know, Everything is fits the picture, right. you know, which is why they call it cartoony when you catch everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they can't change the picture then, but they can color it in more. This is not even just the coloring because you know here nothing is set in stone because the, it's the gamer that has control. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it, it, it's not like a you know it's not like a, you know I mean and who knows what the gamer is going to do? They always have to design it. Even, even you know, every conflict and every battle thing, they always have to say, you know, what if the, the guy may just rush in, guns blazing, or he may want to stay and hide and pick, pick them off one by one. You don't know. Yeah, you know? I'm, I'm the second one. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that makes sense. So they have to design it to, to be able to work both ways. 
and you know, and not just both ways, but they have to design it to work any way that the gamer plays. And you know, because ultimately that's what games that's that's the fun of this medium is is and and what they did in this game is is uh, normally the story is told through what they call cinematics or cut scenes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. which are essentially like a scene from a film or a TV show. Right. In other words, it's set in the, the timing is locked. The vocal performances are locked. The gamer basically is not in control. You just, you just, you know, you just go through it, mm -hmm. and that's what they use to many times to tell you stuff that they need you to know, so the story makes sense, and then they give you control again. In in this one, they tried to include many of those 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 uh, areas with the gamer still having control. It was very different from Uncharted Two. So. Uh, you know, they just thought, you know, let's see if we can design this so we're still telling a story. Yeah. But the, but, but the gamer is in control, and uh, and and let's see what we can do. And so they did it really well. No, oh, they definitely did it really well. And uh, and we all know now. I mean, it's been in the news that an Uncharted movie is in the works. And I know no announcements have been made or anything, and and everything is still up in the air. But if you did end up on the film, would uh, would your scoring approach change at all versus what you do with the game? Well, I don't know. I mean, number one, am I interested? You bet I am. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, I, 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 I absolutely am. Uh, I would have to say it depends on what the film you know looks like. If they made it and it looked like the game, I mean, my scoring approach has pretty much changed drastically on all three games. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did on Uncharted 3 is, is very different from what I did on Uncharted 2. Uh, for a, a number of reasons. Number one, uh, they really wanted to do something different than Uncharted Two. Yeah, and and I understand that. And and you know, if you look at if you look at, at games, once you create a franchise, you have to use the elements that make you know that makes a game a game. You know, some sort of platforming. You know, which in in in, in our case here is you know, climbing, shooting. I mean, those parts are still always going to be a part of Uncharted, mm -hmm. you know, for the foreseeable future, because that's what games, you know, th that's what they do. But what changes is the locale, the graphics, and the music. So those things change, and the story, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. So they they really didn't want to do music that 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 was they way it needed to be cut from the same piece of cloth but not just sound like an extension of uncharted 2 right and it it took me a while to find my my sea legs if you will <laughs> on that but but I did and we ended up because we were in the desert writing you know forgive me from you know talking about stuff that pe that people will go why are we talking about this and I ended up writing in, in a Phrygian mode and basically what that means is you find notes that the indigenous people use in their music and then you string those together into a scale and then you find the, your chord structure from those notes you can still stack them in thirds but you find your chord structure from those notes and that took us in a different direction melodically than we did on, on Uncharted to, which was more, you know, minor chords moving in thirds, you know, which is mm -hmm. just just a different kind of a different feel. So, you know, it took us took us a, it took me a while, and and the action cues are way more aggressive in this in this new one, and I wrote a lot of action cues. <laughs> well, in, you, in this. I did. <laughs> you got like two, yeah. We got the two CD release. So it's it's a lot of. How much music did you do for for Uncharted Three? I have no idea. I never. I never keep track. I, I never. I never want to know, and I never keep track. I, you, you just. You know. And you know what? I'm a little different from a, from a lot of guys that way, because the, the 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 game composers are such a talented group of guys. It really is amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many good guys working in this thing, but a lot of those guys figure everything by the minute, and for I, for whatever reason, I just can't work that way. I mean, just give me, give me, you know, pay me for the project, and and you know, it's not like I'm going to count minutes and stop and go, okay, we're done. Yeah, I'm going to work until, uh, you know, uh, uh, until the, until we're at the end. I will give them anything they need. I will start at the beginning, and I will work until we're at the end. It's just the way I see it. Now, I, you know, if you thought it was going to be you were going to write two hours, and now they go, oh, I think we're going to do four hours. That's a different deal. Yeah, <laughs> but but that's never happened to me. So and you know well you probably already know in all honesty I've never scored any games except for Uncharted so, yeah. so 
So I can say that I've been very lucky that in a, in a weird way, I started about as good as you can get. Naughty Dog has been so good to me. They're so kind. They're so much fun to work with. And, they, they, and Sony's been great to me. And they give me creative liberty just to do stuff. And even if we don't know where it's going to work, they'll just say, well, let's, let's record it. And, you know, maybe we'll find a place for it. And, you know, and we always do. And so I've just been so, you know, part of that is why I look at it the way I look at it. Because, you know, when you work with people who just make your life great and are, and are fun to work with and make you look forward to getting up in the morning and, and, you know, calling them with a new idea or something like that, then, you know, that makes you want to, you know, do anything and everything you can to, you know, and when they raise the bar, you don't, you don't want to be the last guy, in, you know, going, well, I didn't raise my bar very much. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you want to rise to the occasion, you know. And that's what, you know, the, the Firefly did the same thing. I said, look at how good these guys are, you know. i got to try to not embarrass myself here, <laughs> you know. So it, it's just the, it, it's one of the things that happens when, you know, you know and, and, and maybe all team sports are like that. And I, I view this as a team sport. I've always viewed music as a team sport. It's always collaboration, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can write a bunch of stuff on paper, you know, but you, all of a sudden you get these magnificent players who bring it to life, you know, and sometimes they'll look at what you did and they'll go, oh, I see what you were going for. What if I play it like this? And you go, yeah, that's great. So it's just, it, it, it's, a, it's a collaboration of a bunch of people who, who, who do stuff trying to pitch together and 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 make it be great and how lucky is that this time we recorded in london which was a new experience for me wow uh at abbey road and you know the, the you know it was just the, the players had the same attitude as the guys in los angeles or san francisco mm-hmm. which is you know let's just do what we can to make it be great you know which which is wonderful because you know it's really depressing when you have people going, are we almost out of here? Uh, you know, <laughs> when's break time? So, yeah. well, the the hard work shows, and I know I'm not the only one saying it. How much your music makes the game, and and honestly, without it, it would be a very dull and and non fun experience. So, well, that's very kind of you, and and I'll tell you what, to me, that's the greatest compliment you can have. It, I, I don't care if people notice the music or not. You know, in the same way, sometimes you watch a film and you're caught up in it, and 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 guys like you and I notice the music because you know it's what we do. But mm-hmm. but other people might not. But but they might go, that was an exciting movie, and you go, great, the music worked. Yeah. In other words, it add, it was part of the fabric of telling the story, and. It doesn't matter what people see as the preeminent part. If the story works, if the whole thing works, then different people are going to notice different things. But all you care about really is if the visceral experience was exciting and fun for someone or emotional or whatever you're trying to do. And everybody's just a part of the fabric of, of that storytelling process. Absolutely. And I mean, because I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a musician. I don't, I don't compose, but, uh, you know, when I was young, it was film scores that that got me into you know into the to wanting to be a filmmaker. And it was, and I use it for when I write screenplays, for when I edit. It's it's my my fuel. It's what inspires my you know when I you know putting together a sequence or something. So that's that's how how music affects me. It can take you to a certain place, you know. And there are so many great guys out there. I mean, it's just you know I love film scoring because they're there are no rules you know i mean the rule is whatever works which 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 is kind of why you can score a big battle scene with uh action music you know it could be you know or it could be adagio for strings right where you have this big beautiful music and somehow the contrast of the beauty against what you're seeing on screen makes it even more horrible Mm -hmm. and you go they both work yeah there's no right answer, you know. The right answer is just whatever the director, you know, intends for his his project or his or her project. But, you know, it's really fun to work in a place where there are no right answers. Of course, it's a little bit daunting times too, because oh, yeah. be easy <laughs> if you knew the right answer, you know. I mean, if you're writing, then you know exactly what the blank page looks like, and you go, <laughs> if only, you know. Well, before we finish up, I always. Uh... 
I always like to ask composers this uh, one question. Um, if you had the chance to compose the score for any film ever made with uh, no disrespect to the original composer, uh, what movie would you choose? That's a hard one, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> so I'm just going to make one. I'm gonna, I mean, there are so many movies I like for different reasons. I mean, I've always, you know, if, if The Godfather comes on, I'll watch it. I've seen it a gazillion times. I know what's going to happen. I'll watch it anyway. But there's another movie I would, li- would have liked to have taken a shot at. Something about Shawshank Redemption, Ooh, yeah. I find compelling. I find I just find it compelling. I can't, I, I can't completely tell you why. Great, looks great. Great act, great actors, great performances. Something about that just seems like it would be fun to do. Tommy Newman did a, such a magnificent job on that, and he didn't do the thing that you you know he didn't do the standard thing. Mm-hmm. He took some chances on that film, but it's really but but nevertheless. There, that's just a that that would have been a fun film to have sitting on your table. That's yeah. I'm surprised no one has has chosen that yet. No one has no one has repeated themselves yet. So that's what's interesting to me. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Yeah. <laughs> but um, thank you so much, Greg, for your time. I'm out of questions for you, but uh, um, it was definitely an enlightening conversation. So. Well, it was super fun for me, so thanks for the opportunity. And And I look forward next time we do one of those panels to hanging and telling some stories. Oh, definitely. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Greg. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.